Radio Perth. And on the ABC Listen app. And it's seven past ten. Now, I wonder if you have ever thought about applying to become a foster carer and if you've already been through that process, what was it like? Did you find it too hard? And is there anything that could be done to make it easier? And again, if you've been through this experience, we would value your views on this this morning on 1300 222 720 because more foster carers are always needed in WA and when the system runs out, all the results are less than ideal. Ricky Hendon is the Secretary of the Public Sector Union in WA. It represents child protection workers and she joins me this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start with the story that you have to tell and it is a pretty alarming one. Mm. Yes. So um, one of the, the story I'm going to share today is about, um, about a child who is in foster care and had a, a, a very difficult experience. So the boy, um, he was a teenager, very shy, polite, well-behaved young teen. He'd been living with the same foster carer since uh, 2013 and had to enter a group home after his foster carer suddenly died. So he was very traumatised um, by that experience. Um, but because uh, of the dire shortage of foster carers in the system, um, the department was unable to find him an alternate foster placement. Uh, so he was uh, basically, he wasn't well suited to a group home, but he was actually put in a group home um, for uh, with other young people who were in a similar situation. Um, he wasn't well suited to it because some of those group homes can be quite, um, they can be quite challenging behaviour, aggressive, um, antisocial behaviours in those group homes. So in an unprovoked attack, he was punched in the face by a young person within days of being in that group home, uh, resulting in hospitalisation and stitches to the head. And, you know, understandably, he was very frightened to live there after that uh, and an alternate home was sourced, a group home was sourced, but it was an hour's drive from where he'd been living. And so for him, that was going to mean having to change schools, leave his friends and leave his football team, all the things that were keeping him kind of, you know, connected and secure. On track and, yep, yeah. Yeah, all of that. Uh, very thankfully, um, that child's, one of that, that child's teachers, um, put their hand up to be a foster carer and they were priority assessed and were able to get on board as a foster carer and the boy was able to live with them. Um, but it's just, I guess, one example of um, the dire shortage uh, of foster carers in the system, uh, especially, uh, I think, too, from the feedback that we get, um, as children start to get older as well. So um, it's always difficult to find foster carers, but easier when they're very ch children are very, very young, harder when children are teenagers and, you know, they are often very, very vulnerable when they're teenagers too. So there is a dire lack of carers in the system. And it's interesting you say there, uh, Ricky Hendon, that this boy, and I, we don't want to identify him or anything, but was not suitable for a group home. What makes somebody suitable for a group home? Well, I suppose this boy wasn't assessed as suitable for a group home because, um, you know, he was he was shy, he was polite, he was well behaved, weren't challenging behaviours that needed to be addressed in that sort of setting. Um, so he was well suited to be in a, in a home, you know, a, a a home with um, a guardian or, or you know... Um, and he was happy. Parents ..and he was happy in that previous placement. It was a successful placement until his foster carer died. So it wasn't the best solution for that boy um, and it meant that he was also exposed to um, more antisocial um, and aggressive behaviours, having already gone through the trauma of losing his foster carer. And when how, how, uh, how hard uh, do they look? Because can it be a situation where somebody is already um, caring for one child or maybe two and then the department will ring and say, could you take another one? Absolutely. Um, you know, the conversations I've had with um, our members in child protection are that they lean heavily, frankly, on the foster carers that they already have. A lot of foster carers, many, many foster carers, um, care for multiple children because there just simply aren't enough other carers in the system and people have to go back to those carers all the time to ask for more assistance. And many of them continue to say yes, but they also get very, very stretched in the end. And, and that is not always an ideal situation, is it? Because it's disruptive. You know, if you have your own children, uh, you bring in one, but it can also be disruptive to the family unit if suddenly yeah. um, you're bringing in more because they all have challenges. I appreciate that. Everyone uh, and their challenges are, are very, very different. I think too, the more the more pressure you're placing on placing on existing foster carers, the more likely you're going to get um, carers that then get to a point where they can't cope either. So you're placing more and more stress on the system, and you run the risk of losing those carers too. Um, the real challenge, I suppose, uh, that our members are telling us that they have is getting more foster carers into the system. And there's a number of complex reasons for that. But one of them is that they simply don't have the resources internally to properly assess incoming applications for foster carers. So uh, within the department, there are positions called placement officers. Um, they're embedded now into... Um, 
into teams of, of child protection workers. So those child protection workers run a, a you know quite significant caseloads, and there's a foster uh, sorry a placement officer in each of those teams to complement those teams. The concept is not bad, but when the system is so under resourced, those placement officers just get drawn into helping those caseworkers lurch from crisis to crisis. So what they don't get to do is the proactive work of looking at applications for foster caring um, and assessing those applications in a timely manner to get more people into the system. It creates uh, a really problematic bottleneck. So um, Because they're trying to find those emergency ones, like the teacher who finally stepped up in this case and said, I'll take him. They're trying to find those sort of short-term solutions... Yes, absolutely. That you've got all these people saying I'll be one, but yeah. they can't be processed. Absolutely. That's what we're hearing. And, and, and what would that waiting list be like? Hard to quantify, but, you know, our, our members are telling us that it's, it's quite lengthy, that people wait a very long time to hear back about whether their application has been successful. And by that time, you know, that they, they may have decided not to continue. It might have been a bad experience not to hear back from the department. So they have some concerns about becoming a foster, play, uh, you know, a foster carer in a, in a situation where they don't know that they're going to get the support that they need. Um, the feedback that we get from our placement officer members is that there's simply not enough of them to go around, that they're getting drawn into these sort of crisis situations because there isn't enough staffing in the casework teams um, and that there actually need to be more placement officers that aren't attached to those teams so that they can do that proactive work because really it sort of ends up being a little bit of a, um, you know, it just keeps the, 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 the holes in the system just kind of keep feeding themselves. So um, if you're a foster, sorry, if you're a placement officer and you're getting drawn into those casework teams because they're not properly resourced, those casework teams are then put under pressure because they can't find foster placements for the kids they're working with. But yet there's a whole list of them waiting there so, to be yeah. processed. So unless we start to get the resourcing that's required for child protection, put people in these positions to, to bolster the system up so it's so it works better, um, those things aren't going to change. one three hundred triple two seven twenty 720 is the number. If you'd like to be part of this conversation, again, if you've experienced this, um, share your insights, share your thoughts. You can text as well, and I appreciate some people want to protect their identity, and I've got a couple of texts coming through. That's OK, 0437 922 I'm speaking to Ricky Hendon. She's the Secretary of the Public Sector Union, which represents... Uh, people that work in um, in child protection, uh, which is a very, very stretched system, we know. Um, this is a, an interesting text that has come through. Nadia is a foster carer of eight years. I can unequivocally say that if communities want more carers, they need, look to, they need to look after their existing carers. As a carer, you are persona non grata and you have to actually give up some of your personal rights. I could literally write a book on why not to become a carer, but I could also write a book on why you should. What insights can you offer there? I think that rings true with the um, with the feedback that we get from our members. You know, our members are really passionate about protecting children and giving them the best possible opportunities. They want to be able to support foster carers um, to do the critical work that they do um, with young people who are at risk and who are vulnerable. Um, but they just simply don't have the time. As I said, they're lurching from crisis to crisis and can't do the work that they want to do, which is supporting foster carers, supporting kids um, and getting more foster carers into the system. The, the process is quite rigorous and you could argue it should be, but is there a way to make that easier? Does this turn people off? Um, very possibly. I, I do understand, though, why it has to be so rigorous. Obviously, um, you know, uh, we don't want to hear of situations where kids go into foster care and end up in worse situations than where they started. Um, but uh, as I said before, what, one of the things that's critical is actually processing those claims, you know, those um, those applications to be foster carers quickly and providing the support, especially in those early those early phases that people need um, to to get on board with the system, um, understand their role as a foster carer, and feel feel supported to go and do that th that work with those children and provide them with loving loving stable homes. It's uh, 16 past 10 and back in May the Child Protection Minister Simone McGurk told Parliament that we have seen the lowest rates of growth in child protection for over 20 years and in regard to Aboriginal families since 2004. In fact, for the first time in many decades, in the March quarter this year we saw a decline in the number of children coming into care, including Aboriginal children. So does the Minister deserve some credit for that? Anything that improves our, our child protection system should be welcomed, but I guess from our perspective, um, our members are telling us that the system is still in crisis. It is absolutely in crisis. Um, there are still 8,000... Last, the last time we got stats was there were 8,035 total cases um, open um, within 
uh, the Department of Communities, and that there were just under 900 that, uh, of those cases that weren't allocated to a child protection worker. So people, these are children who have cases that are so serious that they need to have an open child protection case, but the department can't allocate them a dedicated caseworker. So what happens to those children if they can't have a dedicated caseworker? Well, our experience is that um, workers are sort of um, asked to ad hoc do pieces of work in those cases, but what it doesn't give is um, stability for those cases. It doesn't give them a regular point of contact or any relationship building with the department, and it means if there's not a constant um, and consistent eye on those cases, that things can blow up in them quite quickly and they can um, end up in much more worse situations than they are currently. I'll finish on a text from Emily. She says, does the reluctance to allow adoption affect the foster care system as well? I've heard people say they would be keen to adopt, but are reluctant to enter the foster system because of the uncertain nature of it. Why aren't more kids getting adopted? And surely that would give better long-term security for these kids to actually find a home and, I guess, reduce the number of kids in the system. Um, you know, in terms of adoption, obviously it's something that's, a, you know, it's, it's quite a complex conversation to have around um, the pros and cons of that. What I would say is that the priority um, of the department typically um, and of our members is to, wherever possible, reunify children with their families because those are important connections and often families go through, you know, some very significant challenges and work really, really hard to overcome those challenges and, and get their children back and provide a loving, safe environment. So, um, you know, I know that that is the priority is to get them back into their families in a, in a, in a safe way. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.